India is one of the most diverse countries of the world in terms of climate, languages, religions, social structures and many other aspects. For this diversity, India is often referred to as a subcontinent. The urbanization processes in India are equally complex as the country itself. This documentary looks at the different periods of city development in northern India in four chapters. Pre-colonial construction time, colonial city development, modern city development and recent transformation processes. We will travel into the metropolitan area of Delhi, the city of Chandigarh, the metropolitan area of Mumbai, as well as Pune and its surrounding peri-urban spaces. In its thousands of years of history, the Indian subcontinent has seen many dynasties and empires come and go. Some civilizations disappeared just as quickly as they had arrived, while the remains of others are visible until the present. In the first chapter, we will have a deeper look into four places. These sites stand as examples for different time periods of urban planning in North India. The first advanced civilization in India was the Harappa, who built the first cities on the banks of the Indus 6000 years ago. After the Harappa, the Aryan civilization settled in from the northwest of India around 1500 before Christ. The Aryan civilization laid the ground stone for later Hindu kingdoms. One of the emerging Hindu dynasties was the Kalachuri dynasty that ruled over the present day state of Maharashtra from the 5th until the 7th century. They constructed the Elephanta Caves on the island of Garapuri, lying in the Thane Creek, just east of Mumbai. The caves are Hindu temples, dedicated to the god Shiva. As such, they were places of worship for the people from the surrounding settlements. The Elephanta Caves contain stone sculptures caved into the rock, mostly in high relief, which show the syncretism of Hindu and Buddhist ideas and iconography. The three-faced Shiva, Nataraja, the Lord of Dance, and Yogishvara, Lord of Yogis, being the most famous. They are most frequently placed between the 5th and 7th centuries. Hindu and Buddhist elements merge in art and architecture of the caves, which is characteristic of pre-colonial Indian history, of culture synthesis, and especially Mumbai, as a melting pot for different cultures and settlements. The Elephanta Caves have been an UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1987. However, many cultural assets were lost due to increased attacks by Huns from the north of India. Today's metropolitan area of Delhi was home to multiple Hindu towns and forts before the arrival of the Gurids. One example is the city of Lalkot, which was an important center of the Toma Rajput dynasty. It was so until the Gurids took over the power and let the city fall into decay. It was here that Qutub Dudin Aibak began building the first mosque on Indian soil on behalf of the Gurids immediately after coming into power. The first construction phase of the Kuvadul Mosque was completed after just a short period of time. This marked the completion of the first Islamic monument in the Qutub Minar complex. The quick construction time is explained today by the fact that both Muslim and Hindu master builders were responsible for the construction. This can still be seen today in the detail of the pointed arches. Columns from old Hindu temples were also used in the construction of the Akkad courtyard. These stand out due to their fine decoration and the cut-out faces of the gods. The reason of the severed faces is the ban on images in Islam. In addition to the mosque, Qutub Dudin Aibak also began building the Qutub Minar. Even on the second floor of the minaret, you can see the skill with which the individual details were created. Verses from the Quran run in bands around the floors. After the death of Qutub Dudin Aibak, the subsequent sultans of the Delhi Sultanate continued the construction of Qutub Minar. Today, the famous minaret is 73 meters high and consists of five floors. Especially during the Kaliji dynasty, many other construction projects were realized in the Qutub Minar complex. 
the Darvaza impresses with its square shape and has four high portal arches pointing in the four cardinal directions. A notable feature of this building is the use of real arches, or round arches, which was an innovative architectural technique at the time. The outer walls of the Darvaza are decorated with numerous marble details, on which inscriptions and artistic details made from red sandstone can be seen. In addition to the monuments from the Delhi Sultanate period, there's an even older and unusual artifact, the Iron Pillar. Research concluded that the pillar was made around 1500 years ago and is mainly made out of iron. Despite its great age, the column did not rust to this day. The origin of this column is also unclear. Today, the Kutub Minar complex has UNESCO World Heritage status and is thus protected from further decay and changes. At the beginning of the 16th century, a new threat arose for the Delhi Sultanate. This time, the threat came from Central Asia and was posed by the Mughal Baba and his forces. He had effective artillery at his disposal, which enabled him to gain control of North India. Thus began the rule of the Mughals. But after just four years, Baba was succeeded by Maibara I Humayun, the second Mughal in India. Today, Humayun is best known for a building that he himself never saw. North of the Kutub Minar complex, the wife of Humayun built a mausoleum for her deceased husband in 1558. A Persian architect was specially invited for the construction. He designed a mausoleum that perfected all Muslim rules of architecture. The entire site is mirror symmetrical, meaning that one half of the building is an exact mirror image of the other half. Humayun's tomb is located directly in the main room. The garden built around the mausoleum is divided into four perfect sections by small channels. The four gardens and the rivers are symbolic to the gardens and rivers of Jannat, the paradise from the Quran. It is a symbol of the power over everything earthly that the rulers of the Mughal Empire believed to have and with the power even able to recreate paradise. In addition to the Muslim influences, Hindu architectural elements were also integrated. For example, several chadras adorn the mausoleum. This combination of several architectural styles created a new architectural style. The Mughal style emerged and continued to be refined throughout the reign of the Mughals. The buildings on the site were decorated with chadras, domes and jalas. Jalas are elaborate windows made of stone. These are intended to allow good ventilation, but at the same time protect the people inside from outside views. The Mughal, who is probably best known for his affinity for building, is Shah Jahan. He ruled the Mughal Empire from 1628 to 1658, and led it into a golden century. Just 10 years after seizing power, he also commissioned Ustad Ahmad Lahori to build a new capital. This new city, called Shah Jahanabad, is known today as Old Delhi. It extended over the entire area of today's Chandi Chok Road, which used to have a water channel alongside the road. The central axis has been preserved over centuries and still reflects its former purpose. It is said that there were once over 1,500 stores along the road. The hustle and bustle of the traders back then is said to be comparable to the situation today. Kutas branched off from the main street. Specialized stores could be found in the individual kutas. Next to the kutas were the townhouses, known as havelis. These could consist of up to 150 rooms in several stories. As the houses in Shah Jahanabad were mostly made of wood, only a few have survived to this day. The Lal Kila Fort lies at the end of the Chandi Chak Road and is also known as the Red Fort of Delhi. This mighty fort was built at the same time as the new capital and was completed in 5048 after 10 years of construction. It was built in the distinctive Mughal style and has a huge entrance portal facing the city, the Lahore Gate. 
The ramparts and towers are made of red sandstone, which gives the name Red Fort. After the death of Shah Jahan, more buildings were erected, but they were no longer as magnificent as under Shah Jahan. Over time, the Mughals lost their power and with it the resources to maintain their empire. The reign of the Mughals was finally sealed when the British took power in Delhi and introduced a new era in India. The succession of dynasties and kingdoms was radically disrupted through the arrival of European colonizers. Mumbai and Delhi are two cities that have been shaped significantly during the times of the British Empire. Due to their geographical location, they experienced different types of colonial urban development. The phase of colonial urban development on the Indian subcontinent lasted for almost three centuries and led to fundamental changes of the entire urban system. Now we're going to explore the colonial city development of Mumbai and Delhi. Join us as we delve into oppressive colonial histories and urban transformation in these two major Indian cities. Mumbai has been the financial and commercial center of India until today. This can be traced back to the British colonization from the 17th century. Prior to European colonization, the area of today's Mumbai was mainly settled by coli fishermen on multiple islands. The Portuguese conquered one of the islands in 1508, naming it Bombayia, the Good Bay. In 1661, as part of Catherine Braganza's marriage to Charles II, Bombayia was handed over to the British crown and became Bombay. The colonial influence changed not only the city's architecture and social structure, but also its landscape. In 1782, William Hornby, governor of Bombay, initiated the Hornby Villard project to connect the seven islands of Bombay through large land acquisition operations. The strategic position for trade and the harbour were favourable conditions so that the East India Company leased the land from 1668 and Bombay became its headquarters. Bombay, as the trading centre of the British, led to a strong increase of the colonial influence since the middle of the 18th century. English urban planning and much infrastructure were developed mainly within a fort, where predominantly English people lived. Over time, racial segregation between British and Indians was established and brutally enforced. The British designed a railway station for long-distance traffic to and from Bombay. They drew plans from the already existing St Pancras station in London. When the building was completed in 1888, it was considered the largest building in British India. Today, it remains as one of the largest and busiest railroad stations in the world. More than 1,000 trains and about 3 million people transit through the station every day. The station was formerly known as Victoria Terminus. In 1996, it was renamed to document the break with the colonial history and to honor an important Marathi leader to its official present name, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Terminus. Another colonial building, based on an English model, is the Rajabai Clock Tower. The British architect Sir Gibbald Scott designed it on the model of Big Ben. The clock plays melodic tones at fixed intervals. During the colonial era, one of 16 melodies was played four times a day. For example, Rule Britannia or God Save the King. Today, it is one of the most important tourist destinations in Mumbai. 
Moving from the coast to India's political center, we approach Delhi, the capital of today's nation. Formerly located in Kolkata, the British decided to move their government to Delhi in 1911. Their government buildings still remain until today as central secretariats in New Delhi. As already mentioned, there had been previous city foundations on the area of today's capital. One of the oldest is located near the site of Kutub Minar. The very last city foundation before the British rule was Shah Jahanabad. Today known as Old Delhi, Shah Jahanabad was established by the fifth Mughal emperor as the capital of their empire. Old Delhi was central to the British. It was here that the Mughals were banished from reigning over today's India during the 1857 revolt giving way to the British Raj. While causing great peril and suffrage for the Indian people, the British significantly altered the city structure and shaped today's Delhi profoundly by setting up their capital there. However, only 16 years after its completion, India finally reached independence and sovereignty. The construction of New Delhi was a statement of imperial grandeur, order and authority. That was the idea here, that it should be authoritarian, over the pedestal, huge buildings, clear vistas, which you can see nowhere, and also away from the dense and tightly packed Mughal city, Shah Jahanabad or any other city. They incepted these ideas, even if they were aware that they will leave the city, or the country, sorry. Still, there were attempts that, no, we will be there. So I'm not sure what was the mentality back then, right? They were aware that they need to leave, but still, they were putting in everything for their recreation in. Of course, not for Indians, but yeah. It was here in Mumbai, at the Gate of India, where the last British occupation troops were paraded off the Indian land in 1948. Here, the act of reclaiming symbols of conquest and colonization for a new identity can be seen. Originally, the Gateway of India was constructed to celebrate the landing of the British King George V and Queen Mary on a visit to their colony. Today, the yellow basalt arch symbolizes the triumph of resistance and independence for the Indian people. Bombay was once the former headquarters of the East India Company and has retained its position as India's most important economic and financial center. It emancipated itself in many ways, as, for example, by changing the city's name to Mumbai, even though politically this decision was discussed controversially. Meanwhile, in Delhi, the central secretariats constructed during the British era continue to symbolize the political center of the nation. It is important to recall that colonial urban planning was a way to project power, to establish dominance and control. It was part of an empire's architecture, aiming to subdue others, ignoring the interests of those whose land was taken. The brutal colonial occupation ended in 1947, leading to fundamental changes for the country. And from now on, the aim of urban planning was to present a modern and independent India that had moved on from its past. The ideas clearly broke with the colonial ideas, but large-scale projects were still often led by foreign architects and planners importing a concept of modern city planning to post-colonial structures. An example of this is the city of Chandigarh a precisely planned but not perfect urban um, space, as you will see in the following episode.
After independence in 1947, a new era of urban planning began in India. The city of Chandigarh is an example of how urban planning and city development has clearly aimed to break away from the country's colonial past. With the partition of India, the state of Punjab needed a new capital, as its former capital, Lahore, had become part of Pakistan. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first Prime Minister, wanted the new capital to be a symbol of independence, freedom and modernity, and decided that a new planned city had to be built to demonstrate these values. US urban planner Albert Mayer and his team were asked to draw up development plans for Chandigarh. The plans were based on the concept of the garden city, which can be seen when visiting Chandigarh. Although Mayer wasn't the planner who developed Chandigarh's final master plan. For a variety of reasons, Mayer was unable to continue with the planning of the new capital and the French-Swiss architect Le Cubusier stepped in. By his side was a team of Western architects, urban planners and Indian visionaries such as Urmila Oye Kodjuri, India's first female architect. The team adopted Mayer's concept of a garden city but changed the earlier plans to create a city surrounded by a green belt, structured in linear patterns and organized into so-called sectors, based on the four functions – living, working, mobility and recreation, as presented in the Athens Charter. Within each sector of the planned city, Le Corbusier's idea of modernity is visualized in straight lines and cubic forms. Buildings are made either out of concrete or unrendered brick in white or orange to adapt to the hot climate, and windows are characterized by the typical rectangular shape to reduce heat inside. There is a clear hierarchy of sectors, and the closer to the capital complex, the government sector, the better. When describing Chandigarh, writers often use the analogy of the city as a human body. In this analogy, the capital complex represents the head, which explains its prominent location in the northeast of the city, just before the Shivalik Hills. This guarded area includes monuments designed by Le Corbusier, symbolizing India's freedom and modernity after independence. It is now possible to visit the government buildings as the complex has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Among these buildings are the High Court, the Palace of Assembly and the Open Hand Monument, which is an emblem of the government of Chandigarh. It means the hand to give and the hand to take, peace and prosperity and the unity of mankind. In direct proximity to the capital complex, the wealthy neighborhoods of the city are located. One example of this is Sector 5. Here one can find big properties with big single-unit houses, surrounded by gardens and green scenery. It almost feels like walking through suburban neighborhoods in America or Australia. Due to the division of the sector in smaller parts, there are barely any cars on the road, making Sector 5 a quiet and peaceful place to live. The quickest way to get around the city is to drive on the main axis, which separate each sector and give Chandigarh the unique grid structure. Thanks to the several roundabouts and the wide roads, the traffic is moving along smoothly. Separate lanes for bikes and motorcycles, as well as designated sidewalks for pedestrians, distinguish the infrastructure system in Chandigarh from other cities in India. Especially the use of bicycles as a form of transportation was a pleasant surprise. Moving southwest along the main axis of the city, the road runs next to an enormous green space, which is primarily located in sector 10 and 16. However, green spaces can be almost found in every sector of Chandigarh. They are remnants of Mayer's garden city plan and can be seen as the lungs of the city. Especially the many parks in the city give opportunity for the citizens to escape into nature and take walks, exercise or socialize with friends and family. Another way to spend time outside in the city is Sector 17. 
the heart and commercial hub of Chandigarh. Here one can find a big pedestrian zone with several shops and opportunities to buy food and drinks. On top of that, new fountains and light show elements are drawing in several people in the evening. These installments are part of the latest rejuvenation and conservation project with the aim of revitalizing the sector for commercial activities as well as social interaction to maintain the former function of Sector 17. Directly southwest of Sector 17 lies Sector 22. This sector is characterized by middle class housing. There is notably more traffic and noise as well as people on the street, making the sector feel less closed off than the ones near the capital complex. The classic townhouses, as they have been designed by Le Corbusier, have since been either maintained, changed, or are seemingly run down. The original townhouses, famous for their white and orange colors, can nowadays only be found in a few streets. While most parts of Chandigarh are planned to be open and spacious, there are areas that stand out for their high density. These neighborhoods have developed unplanned, informally and differently from what Le Corbusier expected. The planners didn't take into account the population growth caused by people moving into the city of Chandigarh in hope of improving their livelihoods. This led, in part, to an informal economy with workers who were unable to live in the middle and upper income neighborhoods that Le Corbusier had planned, as he had expected only government employees to move to Chandigarh. The need for alternative housing led to the development of dense areas, demonstrating the existence of informality, even in India's most exemplary planned city. These slum-like areas show that Chandigarh is far from being a perfectly planned city and is subject to change over time as it is transformed by its population. However, there is an interest in preserving the original character of the city. Chandigarh is still known for its high quality of life that is appreciated by most of its residents, even in comparison to more recently developed urban areas. In the last episode, we want to explore India's recent transformations, starting with the economic reforms of the 1990s. As of today, the majority of Indians still live in the countryside, but due to the fast-growing population, we can not only see cities expanding, we also see the urbanization of rural spaces, a transformation process called peri-urbanization. In addition to that, so-called satellite cities were built next to the big cities as a way to relieve the pressure of housing to many workers. To get a deeper understanding of these processes, we will take a final look at the recently developed urban areas in Delhi, Mumbai and the Pune region. As India is a fast developing country, different transformation processes take place in its cities. This is because of the rising importance of India for the global economy. Therefore, it is not surprising that cities like Delhi and Mumbai are growing rapidly and soon became India's first mega cities. Due to the fast growth of Indian cities, there is a lack of appropriate infrastructure and the general supply remains a huge challenge for cities in India. Since the economic liberalization in the 1990s, so-called satellite cities began to develop. These new planned cities not only provide entertainment centers, golf courses or malls, but also possess advanced developed infrastructure like highways and airports, which connects them directly with other cities in the country. This leads to a progressing urbanization and a rise in urban population. The most popular city in India is Mumbai, the financial center of India and the capital of Maharashtra. 
Due to its geographic location on a peninsula as well as the west coast with the Indian Ocean, it can only expand further north. Since the city center, including the old town Bombay and most of the workspaces are located in the southern part of the city, there are massive traffic jams every day. In addition, the housing situation in Mumbai is extremely tense and finding affordable housing space is very challenging for the less wealthy inhabitants of Mumbai. To face this issue, the company Sitco was commissioned with the planning of Navi Mumbai, Mumbai's planned satellite city, in 1971. It is located on the mainland of the Indian subcontinent and is connected to Mumbai by multiple roads and bridges. This connection between both cities still gets intensified by the further development of this infrastructure. Navi Mumbai was once planned as a residential area for people from Mumbai, but now has progressed to an independent city with its own economy. However, there are some problems the city is facing. One example being a new built metro line, which is currently out of service due to political reasons. To realize such huge urban planning projects, there is always the need for a great amount of financial capital. Prestige projects for the upper income classes, such as the creation of golf courses, intend to attract new investors to the city. This often happens at the expense of the lower income population, even though the local companies are obligated to take their needs into account, the investments in large and expensive residential projects for the upper income classes still remain more profitable and show the presence of urban inequality. Another example of a planned city is Pimpri Chinchwat, which together with Pune forms the Pune region. It was established in 1982 when the Pimpri Chinchwat Municipal Corporation, short PCMC, was founded. Since then, the PCMC is responsible for the city planning and seeks to attract industries, but also creates modern and high-quality living spaces for the inhabitants. After Mumbai, Pimpri Chinchwat is the second largest industrial area in the state of Maharashtra. The well-developed and constantly evolving infrastructure makes the city an attractive location for different industries and global leading companies. To maintain these local advantages for the economy and to provide the inhabitants with the best mobility options possible, the PCMC keeps investing in the infrastructure and tries to improve the traffic flow through several flyovers or the construction of new railroad lines. The city Pimpri Chinchwat is connected to the harbors in Mumbai and Navi Mumbai as well as other national trading hubs. The city is currently going through a transformation process where more and more IT companies become aware of the local potentials and set up branches. For example, Hinjavadi, a modern industrial area where many car factories have both their research and production facilities. ThyssenKrupp Industries India is one of the biggest producing companies in Pimpri Chinchwat, with a factory in the middle of the city. The manufactured products and machines are being used for India's agriculture, farming, mining and sugar planting sectors. Therefore, Pimpri Chinchwat is a good example for a planned industrial city on the Indian subcontinent. Looking at current urbanization processes in India, the emergence of new cities around the main urban centers is very important. Even the capital of India, Delhi, has several satellite cities nowadays. In comparison to Pimpri Chinchwat as a planned industrial city, the city of Gogaon can be described as the complete opposite, as there was no unique administration planning before 2008. The city evolved from the merge of small villages close to Indira Gandhi airport in the 1990s. And we will be seeing that how an urban village, especially right here, right at the entrance of Gurgaon, so this was the second metro station inside Gurgaon, where this particular village is there. Today, Gurgaon is the second largest IT location in India. It has a well-performing street infrastructure, including eight-lane roads, as well as various shopping malls and office buildings, which are mostly skyscrapers. Although 30 years ago, Gogaon looked completely different. There were mainly small-scale agricultural structures and not a single international business headquarter. 
However, the logistically favorable location near the Indira Gandhi airport, as well as the relatively cheap land, led the private investor Delhi Land and Finance Corporation to invest in the region. Today, well-known companies have offices in Gurgaon, for example, BMW and Toshiba. This is due to the good conditions the companies find here. But still, the mainly good infrastructure has its weaknesses, especially for the local residents. The supply with electricity regularly fails and power must be supplied by diesel generators. Slum is generally not a building type. It is considered as a building type, but eventually it's a living situation. There are predominantly six things not there. For example, not adequate light and ventilation, dilapidated structure, that is it can crumble anytime, no supply of electricity and water, or less supply of it, maybe they would be getting on the ground floor, social inclusion is least, and among many others. Public transportation and green spaces are almost non-existent. Residents of Gogaon noticed this in the declining quality of life, which is why the NGO I am Gogaon was founded. Its goal is to make Gogaon more livable through various projects such as the Eco Restoration Project. This is one of the only spaces outside the metro that is designed for the visually impaired, the only other space in the city. All the projects that we are doing, these are projects for the public. You can ride a bike or you can walk. It's not only for people who have a car, it's for people who are walking or bicycling. Money is coming from the uh, corporates. We have about 100 plus corporates who have uh, sponsored uh, the plants and the making of the projects. And the work, a lot of the citizens come in and as she said, we have about 50 schools whose kids come every year for planting. So like this is the season when there's so much joy and happiness and planting. You are your city, you're responsible for what happens there and you should be in a position to do something for the city in whatever way you can. Current urban transformation in India is often connected to peri-urbanization. Due to the increasing population pressure on cities, new mosaic-like mixed spaces of rural and less rural spaces are forming around them, which can be described as peri-urban. Peri-urban spaces are places of exchange between the urban and the rural. That is why it is often called peri-urban interface. One of these emerging spaces is Powered Village which is located 30 kilometers southwest of the growing education hub Pune. This formerly rural space changes rapidly in terms of land use as well as socio-economic and cultural patterns. Peri-urban spaces are characterized by more and more fragmented spaces, several forms of land use and different settlement structures. And the term peri-urban means literally the place or the space that is surrounding the city. And the interesting thing of the peri-urban is that it's something which is very unique to the global south. Because at the same time, it is a space that is transforming very quickly. Because there's a high pressure from the urban to the peri-urban. And the urban needs the resources from the peri-urban areas, like water, like fresh air. But it's also using the peri-urban space as a kind of sink. Powed doubled its population since the early 1990s to nowadays 4,500 inhabitants. Emblematic for this growth is the new township of Plater. As a township, the connection to infrastructure services like constant water supply is mandatory. This is in contrast to traditional approaches. Established mechanisms of self-government are eroding as new groups move in and new power relations evolve. In the past, the water supply was free for the villagers in any amount. Due to the increasing population and the now limited amount of water, the resource is nowadays commercialized. Some people actually expect that all peri-urban areas will be urban in future, um, but I would actually see it different. Major changes can already be seen in these spaces. Actively shaping them in the future remains a major task. We actually have a, um, a chance to influence urban future.
And that is what we have also seen on our field trips. The chance is that it's also a space that can be shaped. So actually we can build better cities there and we can, um, through good management systems, actually keep green spaces free. And this can be actually areas which offer a high quality for people to live if they are developed wisely. So this is where I see the chances. The recent urban transformation is highly influenced by India's diverse urban past with elements and structures of pre-colonial, colonial and modern urban planning being visible in most Indian cities. As India's urban population will grow by almost 250 million inhabitants by 2050, the ongoing transformation will be decisive for India's urban future.